Help us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, one of my favorite missionaries um, of all time that I've, I've read his story is, is, is John Patton. So if you've never picked up his autobiography, I, I love it. It's, uh, I also love how it was arranged in, in chapters that are like three pages. Those are my kind, of, <laughs> my kind of books where you feel like you're making progress, you know. Uh, I've read six chapters today. Um, well, anyway, it's, it's a fascinating story about a Scottish missionary who felt compelled to take the gospel to the unreached peoples of the New Hebrides Islands, today known as Vanuatu, in the South Pacific. These islands were known to be inhabited by cannibals. There had actually been missionaries who had gone a few decades before, and as soon as they showed up on the seashore, they were attacked and eaten. Well, when Patton heard that, he thought, that's where I've got to go. I've got to take the gospel to these, to these people. So as he was preparing to go, he would speak at different churches and asking them to pray for him and help him in his, in his mission. And he went to one particular church, and, and afterwards... He was approached by a well-intended man. The, name, the man's name was Mr. Dixon. And Mr. Dixon proceeded to rebuke John Patton for his, his ambition to take the gospel to an island where there's cannibals. He warned him that this was, this was foolish and this was a dangerous mission and that there was, there was plenty of, of ministry that needed to be done there in, in Scotland. Mr. Dixon said this to him, you will be eaten by cannibals, to which John Patton, who had obviously thought about this, replied to him, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I am eaten by cannibals or worms. In the great day, my resurrection body will arise as fair as yours in the likeness of our Redeemer. See, John Patton was, certainly there are fears, but his fears were eclipsed by promise, by the certainty that he served a God who would raise bodies of his children from the grave and, and give him a resurrected body. He had the promise of glory before him and that, that fueled his desire to obey the Christ who had shed his blood and given him new life. That is the heart of, of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And he is trying to encourage believers to have that same sort of of gospel courage, knowing that we serve a God who raises the dead. The Lord Jesus himself was raised from the dead, and that for all those who are in him, that we can take courage and not lose heart, because no matter what befalls us in this life, there is a life to come where we will be with him and made like him. That's what chapter 4 and 5 are kind of all about here in 2 Corinthians. There's this call to not lose heart because present affliction will be eclipsed by certain and coming glory. And chapter 5 now presses us further into that promise and the call to not lose heart in the midst of proclaiming Christ and the way that that should apply to our daily life. Follow along with me in chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Actually, look at verse 18, the second half. Uh, it says, the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For, verse 1, we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Therefore, or so, we are, of al we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, 
And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. 1 Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10 here. Paul is telling the the Corinthians, and and by way us, that we are to aim to please God by preparing for our promised glory. We are to, to aim to please God in all things as we are preparing for promised glory. Or you could turn that the other way, that because promised glory is laid before us, we aim to please him. This is the heart of God's word to us this morning. We're going to unpack it in kind of three movements as we look through the text. Verses 1 through 5, we're going to look for promised glory. Verses 1 through 5, look for promised glory. Verses 6 through 8, long for God's presence. We're going to long for God's presence. And finally, verses 9 and 10, we're going to live for God's pleasure. Live for God's pleasure. Long for promised glory. Look for promised glory. Long for God's presence and live for God's pleasure. Let's begin here in verses 1 through 5 again. Look for promised glory. Now you remember if you were here last week, chapter 4, Paul speaks about our bodies. Do you remember the imagery that he used there? He said that we are what? Jars of clay. We're jars of clay, these these fragile, brittle, chipping containers for glory, the glory of the gospel of Christ in jars of clay. He spoke about how our outer man is wasting away, yet the inner man is being renewed day by day. Well, he's furthering that imagery here of weakness now compared to permanence then. And he, he contrasts two dwellings. The tent and a house. The tent that he's speaking of here is is our physical body. It's the the temporary dwelling that we have now in this life. And it's contrasted with the house. the, 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 The permanent dwelling of the new glorified body that we will receive at the resurrection. He's contrasting those two things. The, the, the tent, no matter you get it from REI or wherever it is, it is It is temporary and it will tear eventually. It will break down eventually, no matter how good it is, especially compared to a house. Look again, verse 1. He says, for we know, again, notice here the knowing, we know that if the tent that is our earthly home, our physical earthly body, is destroyed, which happens throughout life, we decay, but then also just physical death, we have a building from God, that's the glorified heavenly body, a house not made with hands, it's, it's divinely made, it's something that only God can bring about, eternal in the heavens. So there is a reality away from the current existence of this world. And this is, by the way, part of God's plan of redemption. You do know this, though, that when you die, you do not just become like a spirit that just floats around. But rather, God has a a plan for your your physical bodies. Our our eternal existence is not disembodied, it is glorabodied, if it will. We we receive a new body. He's going to raise our physical bodies from the grave and glorify them so that we can endure his glory in a new heaven and new earth. Unfiltered access to God needs a different kind of body than we have now. He'll give us a new permanent body. Glory body. Look again, verse 2. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may be not found naked. This is, this is, Christians feel this. And really in one sense everybody feels this. Christians understand why we feel this. Why, why we groan in our bodies. We're informed by the word as to why we feel that way. It's not just because nobody likes being sick or having bodies that fail. There's a sense 
for the Christian that we constantly have a heavenly homesickness. That we just long for God to take us to be with him and to make everything right. He's contrasting this idea of the, the temporary now with the, with the certainty and the, and the hope and the joy and the sweetness of the permanent then. How many of y'all enjoy camping? Yeah, I don't understand you. I don't at all. Uh, God bless you. It's good. May you enjoy. <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes, I, yeah, I've been camping, and th- there's, there's, it can be good for a couple minutes. And then, <laughs> it's, or you go to a retreat center where it's not, not where you're, you know, it's not, not the best accommodations, whatever it may be. As good as camping may be, there's nothing quite like what? Going home. <laughs> and taking that hot shower, putting on some some clean clothes, some, some of that, you know, real fluffy, you know, sweatpants or whatever it is. Not fluffy. But, you know, anyway, comfortable. <laughs> and then, then you, I don't have like some big, anyway. Never. And then you get to sleep in your own bed. You know what that's like when you're traveling around and you just, it's not the same. When you get home and you get in your own bed. It's that similar sort of picture that's here. We have the same experience in our physical, earthly bodies, right? We endure suffering and affliction in these bodies, both small and great. Whether it be you can't breathe because your nose is so stuffed up, or whether it be you've got a cancer that's ravishing your body. We groan in these, these tents, as it were, in these jars of, of clay, because we were we were. Cr- We were created to live in bodies that never got sick. We were created to live in bodies that never felt pain, that never never suffered, never died. We were made for immortality, to live with God forever. But sin ravished that. Sin stole that away, and now there is corruption of, of our bodies. That is why we groan. Amen. We groan in our bodies, right? There's something not right here. Now, for those of you who are are young enough to be like, I've never suffered such affliction. Well, just keep living. It's coming, (laughs) all right? It is. Butch says amen. That's right. He's speaking in tongues over here about that. This is true, right? It's coming. We groan. Notice there, verse 2. Longing. Verse 4. Groan. Burdened. These are feeling words. Christians are not to be owned by our feelings. We walk by faith, not by feeling. At the same time, do not dismiss what your feelings tell you. There is something wrong in this life. You know how you get alerts on your phone and alerts you to something? Well, when, you're, when there's groaning in you, when there's aching in you, when, there's, when there, you wish that you weren't sick, Allow those desires and feelings to drive you to eternal realities. And he says here, verse 3, that we don't desire to be naked. Again, the goal isn't a disembodied existence. That's Gnostic. That's Greek thinking. That's not Christian thinking. That's not Hebrew thinking. Verse 4, for while we are still in this tent, physical, earthly body, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed. This kind of floating spirit is not like the goal. But that we would be further clothed. Glorified body. Right? Re- resurrected bodies are gloriously renovated bodies. You ever, you ever seen something that's been just amazingly renovated? And you're like, wow, I never thought this could look like that. When I... When I began pastoring in Graham, Texas, uh, I, was, uh, I was a single guy, and I, um, in God's kindness, found a house on a lake that I got to buy. Now, that sounds better than, <laughs> this was, this was basically a shed. It was a, it was kind of a, it was not a, it was not a great situation. So it was, it was not, it was not livable at the time. I was a mess, but it had a great view. And was able to get it at a very cheap price. And my dad, he, he was able to come down and he, he was able to spend a whole month with me. And my dad was very handy in his earlier days. And 
he and I stripped that thing down to the studs and kind of rebuilt it back together with some help of some other people. And when that thing was done, it didn't look anything like what it had. It was, it was incredible. I mean, it was no mansion. Uh, now, somebody after me, after I sold it, they bought it and they had some money and they did what I always wanted to do with it, you know. And that was, that's another sermon. But it was, <laughs> it was not the same place. And, and, and it was amazing. I mean, I would walk in there and be like, this is, this is not the same place. Well, this is the same sort of thing that God is going to do with our bodies one day. We will be renovated with some sort of divine craftsmanship that will be comprehensive. It will be a total transformation that will allow us, in whatever sense God does this, to remain recognizable with our unique earthly appearance and personality, yet it will be perfected without sin, without flaw, without weakness. Paul says we groan for this. To be made like we were supposed to be. This, by the way, if, so if you're, you're here this morning not, not as a Christian or you just, let me help connect the dots for you. Listen to this. This is why we're drawn to, to fixer upper shows and body transformation things. Or like, that there's something about that that draws us in that's like, wow, because we love to see transformation. And the reason is because we're hardwired for it. We're made to experience something better than what is, is here. And God promises believers that he will remake our bodies. Verse 4, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. All that is related to death will be done away with. Listen, God will not just do away with our physical bodies and this physical earth. He will remake them, restore them, refine them. God doesn't just wipe it all away and then that's it. Start over with something new. The new heaven and the new earth is a refined earth. It's this earth refined, joined with heaven as things were supposed to be, we with glorified bodies to enjoy him forevermore. Second Peter teaches, the book of Revelation teaches, throughout the scriptures, this is the picture. Now Why? Because there's something, we talked about this in Bible time this week, there's going to be something gloriously amazing in that new heaven and new earth when everything's made right and we're in glorified bodies and, and, and every grave has been overturned, every headstone has been knocked down, every place where the, the blood of humans has been shed through war and all of the sorts of grievous things that have happened in this life, that we in resurrected bodies will live on this earth conquering over all of that because Christ has conquered. And God will receive glory forevermore that he made it all right. He fixed it all. That's true of all things in the universe and it is true of our bodies as well. God will transform the body of every believer that's ever lived into a radiant house in which his glory will dwell forevermore. So a word of encouragement to those whose bodies are st struggling, or you're, or you're struggling with the body that you have. Maybe, maybe your, your beauty, or your weight, or your shape is not what you, you wished, and it's, it causes you constant just grief. Maybe there's a mental health struggle. Maybe it's, maybe it's a constant battle with depression or anxiety or despair, you're like, I just don't want to be like this. Maybe you've been injured and you've just never been able to be the same. Maybe your body is just growing older. I don't know if you know this or not, but like at, it's either 27 or 30, your body starts falling apart. Be encouraged, <laughs> all right? Like this is, it's hard. I've watched this with my parents in, in recent years to watch them get older in ways that are very sad to see. Our brother Wilson Riley, who often sits right up here, is going through a really hard time right now. I talked to him yesterday, and you could just hear him. He's like, I just, I'm, I'm trusting the Lord, but I'm ready for him to make it right. You know? If you ever talk to our brother Danny, up here in the, the third row, who's, who when he was a young man lost his sight, you want to be encouraged? Just ask Danny about his hope of one day seeing God. 
Just let him preach to you. Brother, we love you. And we long to see him too. We live in bodies that just aren't right. And there's a longing we have. Dane Ortland, in his wonderful commentary on this book, says, We long to be dressed in the same immortal resurrection body Christ himself now wears. I want to be like him. He was raised and glorified. Oh, Lord, do that in me. And God promises that he will. Verse 5, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. God has prepared this and promised this for us, and he has sealed his promise by giving a sign of assurance. He has given us himself through the Spirit. So just as a, a bride and a groom will exchange vows and rings, the ring is a, it's a, it's a symbol It says, I'm keeping my promises to you until death do we part, right? Well, God, who never lies, gives believers a sign, a symbol, a down payment, a security, as it were. Listen to this, Ephesians 1. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Same book, chapter 4, verse 30. Therefore, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you have been sealed for the day of redemption. You're sealed now until the day of redemption when God will take you and remake you. His Spirit is given now. And he is working in us now. So there's, in some sense, the first fruits of that resurrected life that we begin to experience here when we have liberty from, from sin and we're not giving in to the temptations that destroy our lives, but by the power of the Spirit we're I aiming to obey him, which is coming here in just a second. But, but we get to experience the life of Christ now. So, brothers and sisters, as our bodies wear down physically, mentally, emotionally, do not lose heart. God will restore it. So look for promised glory. Let it be on the horizon of your heart at all times. Secondly, Long for God's presence. Long for God's presence. So look for promised glory and long for God's presence. In verses 6 through 8, Paul wants us to remember that the goal of our lives is not merely to escape painful existence in failing bodies. Atheists want that sort of escape as well. But, but for the believer, our chief desire is beyond that, above that. It's to be with the Lord. We want to be with the Lord, and we want to be like the Lord. Verse 6, so, or therefore, we are always of good courage. So because God has given his spirit as an assurance that he will remake our bodies, so in light of that, we are always of good courage. Two things to notice here. The word good, good courage means, it means to be bold. It means to be courageous. It means to have confidence. So in the midst of, now think about that, that coupled with jars of clay, tents, doesn't seem to fit because those are weak, frail, falling apart. He says, yet, even then, because the spirit is in you, you can have confidence, you can have boldness, no matter what's happening on the outside, as it were. It's the opposite of losing heart. Chapter 4, verse 1 and verse 16, so we do not lose heart is, is the cry. Here, we are of good courage, we're not discouraged. And secondly, notice that this, we are always of good courage. Always means at all times, in every occasion. Now, don't hear that and be like, oh, so I'm discouraged, I must not be a Christian, that's it. No, it's not what he's saying. It's not what he's saying. He's saying there's, there's something above your experience that you've got you've to keep in mind. There's truth that you've got to tether your heart to in the midst of circumstances. Regardless of the circumstances we face, we never need to despair. Why? Well, because we know. We, we know something. There's a truth that secures us. Circumstances will send us tossing to and fro, but knowing truth tethers us to God and to his purposes that he will hold you fast. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. So this is true right now. If you're in Christ, you are 
Well, at home in your body. But you're away from the Lord because the Lord went where? To glory, right? He is, he is at the right hand of the Father. He is there now. He's gone on before us to glory. And he has left us here for however many days he gives each of us. So in that sense, we are at home in the body and we're away from him. Now, we are in Christ, but we're not with Christ. Now, at the same time, yes, he's with us to the end of the age by the Spirit, but we're not, we don't see him like we wish that we would, which is what he says here, verse 7. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Life here in this, this age, it requires us to have enlightened eyes of the heart that see and walk and live and trust by faith, not by sight. See, the world says seeing is believing. But, but for the Christian, believing leads to seeing. By faith, not by sight. You can't trust everything that you, you see. Especially, I mean, the unique age that we're moving into with AI and all of the crazy stuff there, I think it's actually a parable. In, in a sense, it's a living parable of the picture that you can't trust what you see but you trust what God says. So regardless of what it appears, the question is, what did God say? And you put all the chips on that. Now, that being said, faith is not a blind faith. It is rooted in, it is grounded upon, it is united to knowing truths about God and what he's doing. We, we walk by faith that is fueled by the promises spoken by God who never lies. Though we do not see him, we love him, and we trust him because he is good, and he does good, even when everything is bad and seems to be going bad. If you want to know whether God loves you, do not look at your circumstances. Look at the cross. Look at the empty tomb. Listen to his word. That's how you know whether God loves you, not by what's going on in your lives in this time. Now, to walk by Sight means to set your, your heart and your hope on, on keeping and retaining physical health, happiness in this life in a way that really dismisses God and diminishes the, 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 the spiritual things that are going on in the midst of our suffering. So in the midst of our suffering, what we need to not do is look at, oh, this is, must be who I am. God must be unhappy with me or all this kind of stuff. Pause. Sometimes our suffering is because of our sin, and we need to, you need to have wise counselors around you. But if, you're, if you've confessed your sins and repented of them, and you're walking in, in the grace of God, and you need to not be afraid of that. And, and, and I, over the years of being a Christian, I've watched different, very different responses to suffering in my own life and in the life of those that I have the privilege to, to walk with. I, I can think of one particular person who, who I knew who was enduring great suffering, and it was, it was very, it was severe. But all they could see in the midst of it was what they were losing and how they were being mistreated and who was failing them, which all of those things were very true and should be grieved and should be processed. And yes, there's calls for repentance in all the ways that they need to be. But they couldn't see past it to see that God was working good in the midst of it and to be able to hold on to that. And it just kept leading them to just, just discouragement and despair and wanting to quit. Until God broke through. And they began to see that even though their suffering kept getting worse, and their, their tears and their doubting and their grief in one sense should have been going up, they, by God's grace, began to trust him. Not that they weren't trying to trust him before. They were trying. And it is hard when you're suffering. But by God's grace, they began to see that he is working in the midst of this mess. He's working all things together for the good. That this light momentary affliction, which doesn't feel light, doesn't feel momentary, but it's going to be eclipsed by glory that is to come. And it began to transform the way that they walked through the suffering. They set their heart fully on the grace that is to be revealed. And I just want you to know in the midst of whatever suffering you're enduring in this life, God, God will help you. 
Do not lose heart. That's what he says, verse 8. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. He's like, I'd rather be out of this. I'd rather be away from this situation, from this suffering, from these circles. I'd rather be out of here and with him. This, this resonates with, with every Christian. There's a very real sense where we're like, listen, check please. Like, I am ready to go be with him. Paul expressed this same sentiment in, in, in Philippians 1. Verse 23 says, my desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. So if you, if you ever desire, like, I want to be with him, like, you're in good company. But do not miss out on this unique opportunity that you will have never again. You will never again have the opportunity and the privilege to steward suffering. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a brief window that we have an opportunity in the midst of sometimes horrific circumstances to look past what is seen to what is unseen and say, God, your, words, your word says that you're worth it. Help me to trust that you're worth it. And to cling to him in a way that makes angels and demons say, he is worthy of worship. It puts God's wisdom on display. And there is actually strength that, that is given to us in the midst of that. And we want to be away from weak, withering, weary bodies. But more than that, we desire, verse 8, had to be at home with the Lord. Because we love him, we desire to see him. Yes, we want to be free from sinning. But more, let us plead that we want to be with our Savior. Yes, we want to be liberated from our languishing down here and however it's coming. But more than that, let us long to be with the Lord. Yes, we want to be free from grief and shame. But more than that, plead that God would help you to want to be with the Good Shepherd. Ask him to, to use this time of refining to change you. Yes, we want to be free from, from addictions and from cancer and Alzheimer's and death. But more, the believer wants to be with Jesus. Verse 18 of the previous chapter, we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. When I first got to, to Del Rey, there was a number of older saints, some who have gone on to be with the Lord. One of them was a sister named Sarah Fuel. Uh, and Sarah Fuel was, she was a sweet, humble, peaceful sister. Uh, she could get a little, you know, she'd get, she'd get after you if you need to, but like she was, she was so sweet. And she loved the Lord. Well, as she grew older, she got to the place where she needed to be put in a nursing home in, in Annandale. And there was a number of families who would go and visit her. I think the Butterballs often went over and uh, visited with her. I know there were others. The last week of her life, we didn't know it was obviously the last week of her life, but we, a number of people from the church went over there to visit with her. And she had been largely unresponsive for, for a little while now, but people huddled up in that room and they began to sing. And as they began to sing, she, she kind of came to, and she began to mouth some of the words. And you could see a little bit of a, a smile in her, on her face, and she kind of came to for just some, some moments of, of sobriety. And after everybody kind of left, or most people left, I went over to her and just held her hand, and I, uh, I said to her, I said, I said Sarah, how, how you doing? And she just looked at me, and she said, I'm almost well. Her jar of clay was all but crumbled. Her tent was all torn apart. She couldn't get out of her bed. But she was more alive than most people on the planet. You could see it in her eyes. She knew that what she was about to cross into was going to be worth all of the pain and the suffering and everything that she had endured. Because she served a God who makes promises and keeps promises. She was looking for glory, and she was longing for his presence. She was almost well. And now, today, she's well. Not by faith any longer, but by sight. 
Sarah lived and died with her heart tethered to the hope of Jesus being better than anything else. So, long for God's presence in death, but also in life, which brings us to our third and final point. Live for God's pleasure. Look for God's promised glory, long for God's presence, and live for God's pleasure. In verses 9 and 10, it begins, verse 9 begins with that, that word that we've seen a couple times now, so or therefore, depending on your translation, it's the same word in the original language, it's connecting logic for us. In light of the fact that Christ has been raised and you will be raised and, received a new, and receive a new body and brought into his glorious presence, in light of that, always aim to please him, is what he's going to say here. So whether we at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. The, the word our aim or make it our aim, it's, it's one, one word. It means to set something before you as a goal, to, 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 to have an ambition towards something, to strive after something. In, in high school, I was kind of forced to run high, uh, cross country. Um, our basketball coach said, if you want to make the team, then you can run cross country. So one of the things that we learned to do, though, in cross country is that the coach would take us to the finish line at the beginning and show us where we were going. And then we would go back and we'd walk all the way through the whole course and then come back and visualize coming in to the, to the end. And he would do that because he says, while you're running, I want you thinking about that last stretch and pressing through and pressing on past the goal. He set that in our hearts. Well, here what Paul is saying is that there's something by the grace of God that he puts in the heart of a believer. The believers, our aim is to live for and to please the Lord. We want to please him. Now, let me tell you what that doesn't mean first. We don't strive to please him, to pacify him, or to impress him. That's not what it means to, to, to please the Lord. We, we can't live well enough. We can't be pleasing enough to earn his favor. Some of us have, have bosses or coaches or, or parents or, or, or people in our lives that you feel like you're constantly having to try to please them, to stay in good favor with them or to, to, to get something from them. That's not how it is with the Lord. Jesus paid it all. He lived perfectly in your place. And now, if you are in Christ by faith, if you've turned from your sin and you've trusted in him, he is pleased with you, and now you aim by faith to please him. So, so pleasing him, if you're a Christian, is something that flows from our love for him. In light of all that he has done for us, that he has created us, that he has sustained us, that he sought us and saved us, but now he's sanctifying us, making us more like Jesus, that he's providing for us, that he's forgiving us, has forgiven and continues to forgive, that he pursues us in light of his love for us, which is abounding. What other response could we have to him than I want to live for him and I want to please him? So when a believer reads something like John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will what? Obey my commandments. What, what we're not intended to hear is like, oh, hear the burden, hear the weight, hear this crushing command that is on me that's like, oh, no, I've got to do something to please God. That's not what, it's not what God intends us to hear. Jesus has given himself for you. He died on the cross, took the judgment that we deserved if you are in Christ, rose from the dead, and now he welcomes you. He says, don't bring anything because you can't bring anything. Just come by faith and you are received and sealed and kept and loved. And in light of that, respond in the only appropriate way. Yes, Lord, help me follow you. Help me trust you. Help me obey you. Help me do whatever it is that you, you want me to do, whether it be private or public. Our aim is always to please him with every text message. Would this please the Lord? Would this grieve the Lord? Do you remember that, the text we heard earlier from Ephesians 
chapter 4, verse 30, that we are, uh, where did it go? There it is. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't grieve him. We grieve him when we sin against him and we sin against others. So our goal with, with the God who we've been united with in fellowship is now not to grieve him by, by harming other people or misusing his name or sinning against him. We don't want to grieve him, but rather we want to please him. And what pleases him is when we come and say, Lord, I'm too weak for this. This is so hard. Help me. He loves that because that is the posture as children that we come and we say, I need your help. This, by the way, this posture I have found extraordinarily helpful in fighting against sin and pursuing holiness. I don't know what it was that I used to think that I was doing with obedience, but I just felt like I had to obey because it was the right thing to do, which is totally true. But that's not all there is to it. I have to obey because it's the right thing to do, and the right thing, and it's because he loves me, and because I love him, and I want to love him more. So in light of that, why would I give in to sin? Or listen to the way that Charles Spurgeon said it, if Christ has died for me, I cannot trifle or play with the evil that killed my best friend. Why would I want to do anything that grieves him when he has done nothing but love me? Pleasing, and he's rigged it to where pleasing him by obedience is where your joy is. Sin promises you joy in fleeting pleasures, but it's like eating cotton candy. It's great for a second, but then it leaves you kind of sick, and you're like, it's, there's nothing there. But Christ, feasting upon him, there is life. He says, I say these things that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. True joy, true happiness in this life is found in pleasing him. It also empowers our proclaiming of the gospel. One of the interesting things that I didn't notice until um, I, I was reading through something that John P Piper had written on this, this text. This whole context in chapters 4 and 5 is about having courage as we speak on behalf of Jesus. Look back at 4.13. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak. We talked about that last week. That the reason we, we because we believe, we speak about Christ. And then the end of chapter 5, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you, implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. That, that's what fueled John Patton. John Patton said... <laughs> I believe, and in light of this, I've got to take the gospel to people who don't know it. This fueled his obedience to the Lord. He wanted to please him. The other motivation, not only that we want to please him, but we want to please him because one day all things will be evaluated. Verse 10. For, so this is what drives us in our aiming to please him. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. All people who have ever lived have an appointment with the Almighty. This is intended to instill an appropriate fear in our hearts. But, but not a fear that makes us run away from God. Listen to how Piper says this. He says, the judgment of believers awakens in Paul... A kind of fear that does not push us away from Jesus, but draws us to him. We embrace it. We want it. Because that is the path of Christ. This text gives us a little bit of a, this section actually gives us a little bit of a theology of what happens when we, when we die. So when a believer dies, body goes into the ground, their spirit goes to be with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. In, in some sense, there is, believers are, they're awake and alert now in glory. We see this in Revelation chapter 5, where they cry out there, how long, O Lord, waiting for justice to come. We see it in chapter 15, where they're all singing together. We've described it as kind of the holy tailgate. It's not into the, not into the new heavens and new earth, but it's, it's in the intermediate, awaiting for the return of Christ when the new heavens and new earth will be unleashed. So there's a, there's a holy tailgate and glory right now going on, singing, hoping, longing, waiting. 
when Christ returns, all those who remain will be caught up and glorified after the bodies of the dead who are in Christ are raised and glorified and reunited with their spirits. And then we will be with him forever, and then he will take us to the great right, or to, the, to, the, to the great white throne judgment, where believers will then stand alongside unbelievers. So if you're an unbeliever, what happens when you die is your body goes into the ground and your spirit is absent from the body, is not present with the Lord, but is present in a place called Sheol or Hades, the place of the dead. There's parables that te Jesus teaches about, about this place. It is not a place of comfort. It is basically the waiting room for hell. It is a sorrowful place where there is no hope. That's why this day, the scriptures say, is the day of salvation, that you will hear and turn to Jesus, because we all have an appointment on that last day with the great judge. All will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So at that last moment, that last day, all people, believers and non-believers, will be brought before the Lord. Jesus tells a parable about it. He'll separate sheep and goats, sheep on one side, goats on the other, believers, unbelievers, and each one you remember what Jesus does there? He, he gives out rewards and judgments based upon what they did. You fed me when I was hungry. You clothed me when I was naked. You visited me when I was in prison. And people say, when did I do that? And Jesus will show acts of obedience and acts of disobedience. And it will all be unveiled. Every word, everything unveiled. For the unbeliever... They will stand in what many have boasted of in this life, that I've been a good person. I just want you to know, if, if that's kind of your plan, to stand before a holy God and be a good person and think that you'll make it in because you're better than other people, please do not be deceived. In the end, you are not compared to me or to anyone else in this room or anyone else who's ever lived other than Jesus. You're compared to him in all sin and fall short of his glorious presence. And on that last day, you will be standing with all of your deeds in your own righteousness, and it will be found lacking. And a right, good, just judgment will come. But that's why a word like this is given to you today, that you might hear mercy and turn and flee to Jesus. Today is not too late, that you will hear this word again one day. May it move you to seek Christ who wants to give mercy. For the believer on that day, that prospect of all things being unveiled could be terrifying. But the good news for the believer is that because Christ's blood covers our transgressions, when our books are open and our deeds are examined, what's not seen anymore is our sin. Because it's been atoned for, it's been covered, it's been paid in full. And what remains are the good deeds done by faith in the power of the Spirit aiming to please him. All of those times that you didn't send that text message that you were going to. All those times that you confessed that sin that you, you really didn't want to. All those times that you, you, you leaned upon God for grace and fought and fought and fought and, was, and strove to forgive somebody who hurt you. All those times that you didn't give in to that temptation that was so alluring. All those times you were willing to endure suffering and trial and mockery for his name. It will all be seen before a holy God and there will be reward that will be given. This is the hope of believers. This is why now we aim to please him, because he sees it all. And we don't do it so that we'll be received, but so that on that day, Jesus will receive much glory, and we will receive much joy, and, and the, the work done by the Spirit to the glory of Christ on that day will fuel praise and thanksgiving and celebration forevermore. The psalmist says, I will thank you forever. Heaven will be one, the new heaven and the new earth will be one big party celebrating the grace of God toward unworthy sinners and the way that by his spirit we live for his glory and he did nothing but love us in spite of us. That is the hope of believers and that awaits us. So, friends, aim to please God by preparing for promised glory. Or we could say it, promised glory is coming and allow that to move you to aim to obey him. Look for promised 
glory. Long for God's presence and live for God's pleasure. And don't do it alone. You need one another. This is what the church is about. We're about to say amen and sing a couple songs and then the applying begins. So this is where you lock arms with one another and say, help me live this out. That's what we do for the rest of our days until we see his face. Come soon, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we pray that you would indeed help us. Help us, Lord, to long to see your face. Would you help us to desire to please you? And Lord, for those of us who have maybe quenched the spirit in such a way that we don't really even think like that much, oh, Lord, would you forgive us and would you restore to us grace upon grace that we might confess sin and turn from it and be filled with your spirit? Lord, would you make this congregation a people who live in light of the last day? Would you give us humility and holiness and happiness in Christ? God, would you change us? God, we pray that you would fill us with joy and hope. God, we need your help. We thank you for your word, and we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.